change, all right? All this preparation. Just a bit. But Just a bit. You know, but we, ha we are a good team. Okay? Right. Yes, everybody can. Everything is possible right. with them. Yes, everybody can lend a helping hand. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, how about Goja and... I think that, you know, and Idalia, right. <laughs> Idalia, I'm sorry, I just <laughs> tried to find. I've given them the links, but still we have classes, right? And perhaps this is this is the reason. Mm. Uh, even in the... Uh, it's not in the evening. evening. Yes, but we have evening classes, right? Huh. And, and it's Friday still, uh, a, a, a regular day. Okay, everyone, uh, welcome again to the last <laughs> plenary of the day. It's not uh, really nice to see you all here in the evening. Let me introduce Dorota Verbinska. Again, she, well, I happened to uh, have the chance to work with her through the project, and it was a pleasure. Dorota Verbinska is an associate professor or uh, in the Institute of Modern Languages at Pomeranian University in Poland. Actually, she had the experience of being a teacher actually in the classroom and she's a teacher trainer, especially, a, I mean, an in-service teacher educator. And she's a prolific writer actually, four books, something like 60 articles, book chapters, nationally, internationally, and her research areas are teacher training, language teacher education, uh, both pre-service, in-service, uh, particularly focusing on uh, reflection, teacher reflection, teacher identity, and she's fond of qualitative research. Am I right? Yes, definitely. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, the stage is yours, Dorota. Okay. I'll take it in time. Right, thank you very much, uh, Goncha, and thank you everybody who has come. I know it's been a long day uh, and you must be very tired. This is the last session, so, so I really appreciate this and hopefully uh, it will be worthwhile. And thank you, Goncha, for organizing this conference. Uh, I know that we should have met in, in the spring, but well, uh, life is life. And well, it's wonderful that that uh, well the the, the conference right uh, has become uh, the reality, and we can we can meet. Uh, so uh, just a few words about myself. Uh, uh, I am from Poland, so this is the map of Poland, and this is this red mark is uh, the place of uh, uh, well. This is this is where where we live where our university is, uh, and uh, uh, right, Pomeranian University of Swaps, so it's not um, far away from, um, uh, from the Baltic Sea. Um, and well, in fact, it's, uh, it's not a nice day, it's quite gloomy right now, uh, but I, I think that I should have said good evening. So good evening, Turkey, right? Because it's the evening already in, in Turkey. Uh, and today I'm going to talk uh, about geoethnography. Geoethnography, uh, right, uh, in English language teaching as a new way of developing free service teachers, but also in service teachers reflective skills. And uh, my purpose for today's presentation is twofold. some problem. Okay, so first of all, to elucidate the concept of geoethnography to those who haven't, haven't encountered this, this term before, because in Poland, a lot of teachers still don't know what it is. Uh, it hasn't been with us uh, for a long time, that's why. And then to present an example uh, of a geoethnographic project just to show you what it uh, well can look like. So, so this is uh, simply an illustration of a ethnographic project. And my agenda 
uh, is as follows. What, what is it? What is dual ethnography? Tenets of dual ethnography. Uh, why dual ethnography? And then an example of a dual ethnographic project in Pomeranian University in Slupsk, Poland. So this is the place uh, where, uh, where I work uh, and where I conducted this uh, project. Okay, so in a word, uh, right, uh, do ethnography, sorry, uh, is a qualitative research method, and it was created by Richard uh, D. Sawyer and John Norris uh, less than a decade ago. And I, I have to tell you that uh, I, um, well, first, saw some information about this method. So this uh, blue book uh, on the internet, I ordered it, uh, I read it uh, when it arrived, I uh, almost devoured it. And I thought, oh, really, that was it. I've been waiting for, for, for this, uh, for, for such a book for, for such a long time. So it really reflected what I've always well um, uh, thought about language teaching, uh, uh, language learning, uh, and well, uh, then I uh, simply uh, well ordered some other books by uh, the same uh, authors. So uh, dual ethnography. So this is uh, the main book where uh, the writers present their tenets, uh, and also two other. Uh, books, uh, uh, forms of practitioner reflexivity, uh, and here dual ethnography. Uh, so uh, this is uh, dual ethnography dialogic methods for social health and educational research, uh, and uh, both of them are edited books. Uh, and I just thought that we should have something uh, done about dual ethnography in our field in English language teaching in TESOL. And right. Sorry. And uh, in February uh, this year, a book appeared by Robert Lowe and Luke Lawrence, published by Multilingual Matters: Dual Ethnography in English Language Teaching: Research, Reflection, and Classroom Application. So uh, the book that uh, uh, I would say is very much, uh, uh, well, uh, is, uh, I would encourage uh, to read this book uh, to those who, uh, who really believe in reflective and reflexive teaching. Uh, and well, uh, uh, definitely a, a worthwhile reading. So what is, what is the ethnography? Uh, I have here, uh, um, put down some uh, parts of uh, uh, different definitions relating to, uh, to this concept. And I think that all together, they can make up the concept much better. So for example, this is the juxtaposition of the two story, of the stories of two, that's why it's dual, or more diverse people who experience the same phenomenon in a different way. So simply two people are talking about the same phenomenon, about the same subject matter, about their topic uh, that they can select in advance. Uh, the, it is the conversation between two people, but it doesn't have to be uh, a face-to-face -face conversation. Obviously, it can be an online conversation, but also it can be an email correspondence. It could also be between people and cultural artifacts. So when you uh, well look at photographs and the photographs evoke some experiences. And the thing is to generate new meanings, to reconceptualize, well, uh, the, the subject matter under discussion. Uh, another thing, exposing the voice of each dual ethnographer. So the voice, the focus on subjectivity is what matters. Uh, working in a tandem to look critically uh, and question meanings. So, uh, well, criticality is important. Criticality, and we know that this is uh, one, of the, uh, one of the skills uh, for the 21st century. Deep exploration of a topic, uh, but this is, uh, well, 
the exploration through the inquirer's uh, stories, their life stories, their biographies, and looking for differences, not similarities, not commonalities, with uh, uh, the intention of creating new texts and generating new meanings. Dua ethnography is a bit similar to Otto ethnography because in both, uh, well, uh, Dua ethnography and Otto ethnography, there is the focus on subjectivity. Uh, and also you look critically at yourself from the perspective of context from the perspective of social context, cultural context, uh, political context, geographical context, but there are differences. Because in Jew ethnography, uh, the inquirers uh, seek transformation and they do autoethnography in tandem together. So this intersubjectivity is there and they investigate a subject matter in order to reconceptualize their uh, interpretation and their interpretive narration. So I just put down the question, how come that participants understand an event or a topic from their own biography in a certain way with regard to, uh, well, cultural aspects, geographical aspects, social or temporal aspects? So how come that the same thing can be understood differently by uh, the two interlocutors. Your ethnography is also a bit similar to narrative inquiry. And what they have in common is uh, abandoning quantitative forms, uh, reductive forms, uh, well, statistical aspects. And both of them push people to organize their experiences and make sense of their lives. And both of them, uh, well, aim at showing the relations between what people think, what they know, what they do, and how their thinking shapes their behavior, and how their knowledge shapes their thinking. But there are differences here as well. Because in narrative inquiry, you are, you are looking for unity, for harmony, for agreement, for order. And here, what is important is deconstruction. Uh, deconstruction triggers narration. So, uh, so there, are, there are differences. And right now, uh, just to uh, offer you uh, a better understanding of geoethnography, I would uh, pass on to geoethnography tenets. There are as many as 14, and they were uh, originated by uh, Sawyer and Norris, uh, so those who came up with, with this idea of dual ethnography. So dual ethnography, first of all, uh, relates uh, and refers to Pinar's Curera. Uh, so Curera, uh, the curriculum, a uh, living curriculum, the person's curriculum, uh, is a frame for investigation and transformation. So this is, this is quite original because you don't have uh, here a formal curriculum, but you simply explore different topics uh, through the prism of your participation uh, and your familiarity with this topic. So uh, Curera is a concept that views life history as an informal curriculum, we can say, and it promotes well, individual, but also collective meaning because you, 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 you do it with, with another person uh, and you can simply, uh, well, analyze and reconceptualize your, your thoughts, your, your previous actions. Another thing, voices bracket in. So here, uh, there is no uh, bracketing out of voices. There is the focus on subjectivity inquirers position themselves in the text. So they can acknowledge their uh, biases, they can acknowledge their uh, prejudices. They simply say that, oh, this is because, well, that was, that was uh, what I thought at that time. Uh, then self uh, as research site. So the self is not the focus of inquiry. 
Rather, it offers a context for the analysis of the factors, social factors, cultural factors that affected your experiences. Uh, so uh, the self uh, is explored, just like in uh, archaeological excavations, we can say, and the events in your life uh, are the data. Uh, then restoring self and other, uh, which means that a goal uh, in geoethnography uh, would be the reconceptualization uh, of your uh, narratives of experiences uh, that have been important to you, so restoring. So uh, the aim is to uh, come up with something new. Number five is, well, quest or question, which means that, well, a geoethnographic, uh, well, process is just like a journey, a journey uh, well, uh, you explore a certain topic, but what is important here is that you, you don't place yourself in the role of a hero or a victim, because uh, they are too extreme and they can, they can limit and close your thoughts and your open, uh, openness. So uh, it is quest for understanding but not with uh, the role of hero or victim. Uh, number six, so, um, well, uh, geoethnography is premised on uh, postmodern uh, notions of identity. So identity that is uh, fluid, recursive, uh, layered, uh, never uh, linear, uh, well, always contradictory, always emergent, and always open to uncertainty and always open to change. Uh, in the seventh tenet, we have, um, well, be um, uh, some kind of, uh, well, uh, uh, instruction that understandings are not found, uh, that uh, meanings are created, that they, uh, they are exposed, uh, that your ethnographers uh, explore the meanings in the process of a dialogue, and uh, they don't find meanings as objective truths or, or some realities. Uh, they, are, they are subjective, and as a result of uh, what, they, uh, uh, what they generate in this geoethnographic process, they can become transformed. Uh, emergency, so uh, the goals of inquiry are never predefined. Uh, uh, well, uh, they are emergent, uh, they are never prescriptive. You don't know which direction the conversation may take. Uh, and also, uh, dual ethnographers have an obligation to promote each other's contrasting views about theories under conversation. So, criticality, critical conversations are important. That's why it's it's good if uh, there are different people, uh, if the interlocutors uh, are diverse. Uh, trust and recognition of power differentials. Uh, so here it's important that there is the safe space, that you feel good. So even if there are some uh, power differentials, social differentials between uh, the interlocutors, uh, they should be acknowledged, they should be respected. Uh, and uh, number 11, place as participant. Uh, so uh, place-based meanings, um, uh, well, uh, which means that uh, people uh, can uh, generate different meanings in different places, and those who have lived in different places uh, know uh, how, uh, how the place has changed them, uh, and similarly, literature uh, can be uh, the participant as well. So uh, literature uh, can, uh, can inform uh, this inquiry, uh, but uh, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, the participants quote uh, literature on the spot. Uh, they, can, they can refer to this, they can look up the literature, they can look up certain meanings, certain references, and they can come back to it. Uh, difference as heurism, 
so uh, geoethnographers juxtapose uh, narratives of difference, uh, never narratives of similarity, to examine and uh, open uh, new perspectives on uh, experience. And finally, the reader uh, is acknowledged. So the reader is a co-participant. Uh, the reader is an active witness. Uh, and um, well, um, uh, it is important that what they say can resonate with the reader. And uh, if this resonates uh, with readers or, or with the audience, so then we can talk about some uh, catalytic validity. So, so, so um, we can say that um, uh, it, is, it is true or, or this uh, experience is acknowledged. Uh, functions of geoethnography are, so um, there are five main functions. Uh, the first one would be informative function. Uh, because if the two inquirers talk to each other uh, and when they discuss a certain topic, so they give uh, quite a lot of um, uh, examples uh, through uh, examples that happened in their lives, situations, they recall the situations in which they participated related to this topic. So thanks to this, uh, they can uh, learn more about this topic. Uh, for example, they can learn about their own decisions uh, related to this topic. So if a topic is language teaching, uh, they can think why they, uh, well, became teachers in the first place, why they chose uh, English philology, why they wanted to study this, whether it was their decision, uh, how agentic they were in this respect. Uh, so they can also learn quite a lot about their positionality. So uh, this, is, uh, this is the informative function. Relational function, uh, also uh, very important, uh, especially when you uh, want to introduce this with, with students. So sometimes uh, students, um, well, uh, can, uh, it can change the dynamics. It can change the dynamics because uh, when you talk to somebody and when you uh, want to express uh, your understanding of a certain topic, uh, you, have to, uh, you have to have a, a safe space. So some kind of relationship uh, is established at the same time. And it can be also important for students uh, in the sense that uh, they are only in the process of uh, the teacher self formation. And sometimes they think that certain, uh, certain things only happen to them. Uh, and then uh, in this geoethnographic conversation, they can see that no, it's not only them, but other people can have the same anxieties. Uh, they can have the same stresses, the same problems before going to the school placement, for example. Uh, so a special kind of relationship uh, can uh, can be born. Uh, emancipatory, uh, another function. Another function because they can talk uh, with their own voice. They can talk about certain topics that are dear to them. Uh, again, uh, aspects of the subject matter under consideration that they have experienced and they have somebody who can listen to, to this. Uh, so, uh, 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 I think that this is uh, one of the most uh, functions of geoethnography. Transformational, so uh, this, is, this is the goal. So uh, uh, as a result of this uh, conversation, uh, they can uh, become uh, changed. They can become, um, well, uh, different persons, we can say, because they have experienced this transformation. And obviously reflection provoking because uh, over time they reflect, but they reflect in the company of the other person. And this reflection um, is different, is innovative. Uh, they, they do it together. And it's not writing a reflective essay where there is uh, the structure uh, imposed from the teacher, but this is something that they can say um, well in their own words and it is emergent. It is chaotic, 
uh, it is, um, well, full of meaning. So there are no empty expressions here because this is, this is dear to them. So these are the main functions of geoethnography. Uh, and well, here uh, in, in the first plenary today, uh, uh, well, Dewey was mentioned and a teacher as a reflective practitioner. Uh, so I would like to refer to this as well, because for Dewey, uh, the reflective teacher is somebody who is open-minded, open -minded, responsible and wholehearted. Uh, and uh, according to Dewey, open-mindedness uh, would be looking at a problem from a number of perspectives. Responsibility would be thinking about the consequences of your actions and behaviors. And wholeheartedness would be using every situation as a learning opportunity. And when we now look at your ethnography, isn't that reflection? They, well, uh, listen attentively, they listen actively to the other person. Uh, they have to be open-minded because uh, otherwise, uh, well, they, 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 they may not, uh, well, um, uh, notice certain, certain aspects uh, that can be crucial uh, uh, to, the, to the problem. Uh, they, they are responsible because certain, uh, they, they talk about uh, different things from their lives. So they are responsible uh, what uh, will be done uh, with this knowledge. And this is also uh, definitely a, a learning situation. They can learn quite a lot. So I would say that geoethnography, uh, a geoethnographic exercise is very much a reflexive and reflective exercise. And now to, uh, to tell you uh, about uh, the study, just to um, show you an example how it could be done. Uh, well, the aims of, of the study uh, were free. So um, gaining knowledge, how teacher candidates understand teaching English, showing the connection between people's biographies and their future decisions in the teacher's profession, and for myself, uh, gaining feedback about the benefits and limitations of this project. So what they liked, what they didn't like. And well, in fact, I conducted uh, the study uh, in my uh, seminar classes, and there were two editions. The first one was the pilot study uh, with only six MA students. So we have very, very small classes. Uh, and the second one with, uh, with 40 BA uh, students. And the participants were all in the language teaching profile and they were all in the last year, either BA studies or MA studies, and they were all in the process of writing their final thesis. Uh, and the thesis were uh, related to, to, to English language teaching. And all of them were also in the process uh, of school placement, but those from, from the pilot group completed the school placement. So uh, they also had knowledge what working at school uh, is like. And half of them gave private English lessons in their free time, which is uh, very common among students of English in Poland. And all expressed their willingness to work as English teachers in the future. Uh, well, I uh, would concentrate today uh, on, on the first uh, study, on the pilot study, and only on the last question because um, I, I simply want to, to, to give you a sample uh, of a study and uh, I think that it's more worthwhile. Um, so what about the stages? Uh, stage one, introduction to the project. Uh, okay. uh, that was adapted from Broad's uh, uh, and Brown and Barrett's studies uh, in one of the geoethnographic groups. So the first task was find a person in the group in order to conduct an interesting conversation. Despite having a lot of things in common, the person should differ from you in a significant way. So I wanted them to be different, right, in, in a certain way. So 
I wouldn't like, uh, I wouldn't, uh, well, uh, like to have uh, two, two very close friends. Talk to your conversation partner about what teaching a language is, supporting your claims with your own experience, the dialogue should last one hour, and record the conversation. And then hand in the recorded text and the written transcription of the talk. The time limit for the task is one month. So that was the first stage. And then uh, when they uh, brought the transcriptions, I copied the transcriptions. I distributed the, uh, the copies to, uh, to each of them, right? So they had, uh, I mean, they, they had their own uh, copy. So I just wanted them to, to have the text. And I gave them uh, tasks from stage two. Read the transcription of your dialogue with your partner carefully. Focus on the meanings of your words. So only I wanted them to look at their own words. And on the basis of the words used by you, make an interpretation of what kind of teacher you may become. Write down this interpretation and support your claims with examples from the conversation. And then there was stage three and almost the same but read the transcription of your dialogue. So the same, the same uh, copy, but now focus on the meanings of your partner's words. And on the basis of the words used by your partner, make an interpretation of what kind of teacher he or she may become. Write down the interpretation and support your claims with examples from the conversation. And finally, Compare the descriptions made by you and by your partner. Discuss the similarity of both interpretations. Is it the same person in both texts? Or perhaps the person you would like to be? Have you heard the same person or the person you would like to hear? And I can tell you that they uh, enjoyed uh, mostly uh, the last, the, the third task from, from stage three. Uh, so, so they really, they really liked it in both groups. And then evaluate the project in writing in terms of what you've learned about language teaching. Uh, and just, well, in a short-winded way, I, I want to say that that was the answer to the first question, uh, but I, I, I'm not going to focus on this very much. But topics, the themes that were generated in stage one. So uh, teaching English as being a teacher. So this is how they understood. Teaching English as preparing for the future job of an English teacher, teaching English as a way of living. So uh, such themes uh, emerged from, uh, from coding and from working with the data. Uh, and in the second one, uh, when I wanted to see whether there, the, 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 whether there would be any connection between uh, people's biographies and their future decisions in the teacher's profession. So I came up with the choice of a teaching profession. Uh, and here, uh, well, I generated two themes. So significant others uh, had a say in uh, who they uh, became. So usually these were the teachers. Um, uh, sometimes they model teachers, right? And sometimes somebody from their family uh, who really, um, well, uh, encouraged them to, to, to follow uh, their footsteps. And quite a lot of them decided to choose the teaching profession by chance. And school placement uh, was, uh, uh, well, transformation. So, so, so really they, they changed a lot after being um, after after uh, doing some some uh, school practice. Okay, but uh, the most important uh, uh, research question uh, today is their feedback on the project. I wanted to see what they learned from uh, from this project. So, well, first of all, um, uh, I, I wanted to see whether the functions that I mentioned were met. Uh, uh, were met here and whether uh, they, they were able to see any, any benefits uh, of, of, this, uh, of this project. 
And this is what they said. Uh, Robert, for example, uh, the project showed me what impression I make on others. Uh, although he said I may not have learned much, but it was useful. Uh, Joanna, the project wasn't easy, but I was able to rediscover my willingness to be a teacher. And I think it's very, very important. Being a teacher involves taking care, fulfilling outcomes. So, so in fact, she came up with all these uh, characteristics. Uh, and I think that that's tremendously important. The project certainly inspired me to gain deeper knowledge about teaching, because only now do I see that being a teacher is really difficult. Uh, Patricia, uh, the whole project made me ask myself a question. What kind of teacher would I like to become? And I find it very, very important. Emancipatory as well. Uh, so here Kinga said, Thanks to the project, I have become more aware and less self-critical. I feel a certain source of power. So, uh, well, I, I think that, that, was, that was good. Uh, relations developing. So uh, Inga also said, an important part is the possibility of transferring it and using the idea with your working with children or teenagers Today, people tend to forget that a dialogue can solve many problems. So the social aspect, uh, so crucial today, I would say, in, in the world in general. Uh, interesting and educational. Time was spent in a nice and constructive way. We have no possibility to talk about our anxieties, wishes, experiences which can be useful in teaching. And Dagmara said that she would like to experience more projects of this kind. Inga said, such a project makes us think, consider, reflect, draw conclusions. Teachers should be not only advisors, not only guides and counselors, but also good thinkers. And Justina said, well, the project gave us a chance to articulate our thoughts from a perspective of time. Uh, and whether it was reflective, Inga said that it was an innovative way to verify theory presented in the literature uh, because they are discussing language teaching and then they can relate to the situations in which themselves participated. Magda said that that was the first exercise of this kind during the whole studies, which will certainly be remembered. And Patricia said, I will surely use this reflection when I encounter a problem, when I have discipline problems, or I will use it to get students to talk in English in class. Inga, uh, well, uh, wrote that the project was a valuable psychological experiment. But not everything was so rosy. I can tell you that also they pointed to some logistic problems, but it was difficult for them to, uh, to meet, right? They didn't have, they said that it was difficult for them to find time to meet. Uh, there was uh, also a lack of understanding at the beginning. Uh, some of them uh, thought that the project was quite chaotic that they, um, well, didn't understand what would be expected, how it would be assessed, whether it would be assessed or not. Uh, so, well, there were some objections on the part of, of the students. And in fact, to, with, with hindsight, I could say that uh, assessment aspects were the most difficult for me. Uh, right now, I think that it shouldn't be assessed or it could be part of portfolio, or it could be uh, assessed on, on the basis of, uh, well, pass fail, uh, because otherwise it would lose the formative aspect of, of the whole, uh, well, geoethnographic, um, well, intention, I would say. And uh, another thing is that if you ask students well, please tell me how you understand 
this concept, how you understand, well, whatever, creativity, well, curriculum, whatever you want to discuss with them. So then after some time, they can tell you that, okay, I, I know too little, right? But all the time we only um, base on, on our experience, but I would like to know something, something theoretical as well. If I am to be um, a good teacher in the future who is able to theorize. So it is difficult, especially in um, educational environments, uh, just like the Polish uh, educational environment, where there is not much tradition on learning from the dialogue. Uh, although everybody knows that by a participation, they can learn more, but still it is, well, it can be difficult, right? Uh, I'm not saying that it is impossible, but it can be it can be uh, well challenging. Uh, and also another thing is that when they close uh, uh, the conversation, the your ethnographic conversation, so you never know whether they do it because they just want to have it done, want to have it ticked off, finished, or simply that they think they have explored the topic. So, so, so this is also well the problem. Uh, but. Uh, you can use your ethnography uh, as the project uh, in the course about qualitative research methods. And I conducted uh, such a course uh, and I, well, um, I used this and it was, it was successful. Uh, so uh, something different. You can also conduct a geoethnographic project as a pilot study and see what insights, uh, well, geoethnographers, inquirers come up with and then you can investigate this uh, more deeply. It is good, as I mentioned before, for building relations uh, in the classroom. It is good for encouraging change. Uh, it is good for developing critical thinking, uh, as I said before, the skill for 21st century. And it is good for us uh, as kind of professional development. Right, and uh, uh, just uh, a few uh, general education geoethnographic uh, studies and the topics uh, that, are, um, that are mentioned, right, that are used in the literature. So professionalism, uh, portfolio, becoming a teacher, leadership very much, diversity, very interesting topic, how we understand diversity. Uh, also a, a project on teaching through theater, past and present in Rousseau's text, very, very interesting as well. And that was um, uh, interesting in the sense that contemporary students asked educational questions and the teacher who was, um, well, um, very much um, familiar with Rousseau's, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's text, answered with uh, some uh, fragments of uh, Rousseau's texts. So, uh, well, very, very interesting topic because that was uh, the connection between the past and the present. And now uh, the TESOL selected your ethnographic studies, but in fact, I want to draw your attention to, to the topics uh, in our field. So I have noticed that there are generally three strands. The first strand, uh, would relate to privilege and marginalization in English language teaching. So those who are privileged and those who are underprivileged, marginalized. Uh, and uh, so, so that would be native speakers, uh, non-native speakers, um, well, um, uh, very, very often so. Uh, uh, English as an international language, right? Uh, a tale of two teachers, a due ethnography of the realistic and idealistic successes and failures of teaching English as an international language. Uh, so that would, uh, that would go to the first strand. The second one, uh, just like in general education uh, topics, um, becoming an ELT professional, uh, becoming an English teacher, becoming um, a, a, an educator. So, so, you, so you can see that it's not only for learners, but also for teachers, in fact, for, for anybody. And the third strand, uh, ethnography in the language class. So different um, 
well, kinds of projects and uh, different, uh, different, uh, uh, well, um, guidelines for uh, for uh, conducting such a project. So, uh, I would say organizational aspects of of a geoethnographic project. Okay, and the references that I have used in in my presentation today. And a final thank you. And if you thank have questions, I will be happy. It's to quite know. good time because we have some time for the questions. All right. I'm well, sorry. I think if you could stop sharing, ah, maybe I you can see the chat box now. Can you see that? I don't know if you mm, have some questions. Yes. Right. Where, was there a preparatory stage? I mean, mm. when you're pairing the free service teachers okay. together? Yes, yes, yes. Mm. All right. So uh, it looked like this, that I uh, gave them, well, we can say one hour presentation of what geoethnography is and why it is important and what you can learn from this, the function. So something like uh, some, well, the tenets of geoethnography. So something similar to what I presented here, but still, uh, well, there were some problems, right, with understanding. Okay, so they were having this dialogue. Some, some kind of, yes, of yes, yes, some kind of, yes, preparation, theoretical preparation. So if I'm not mistaken, people should pair up uh, with someone who they have who is, yes, who ideas. Is, yes, who is different in a certain way. So uh, it could be, well, the people in a certain way different. So it could be different because they... Uh, well, we have uh, males and females. They are different because they come from different places uh, mm -hmm. and together, or they are different because uh, they are from different countries, right? Uh, well, sometimes we have international students as well. So, can you see the second question here in the chat box? What? What? Is, what again, is, I don't know, Jess. Mm -hmm. This one. What is meaning? Of no, 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 no. What if you can't find enough pairs with controversial viewpoints? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, yes. Thank you for this question. Yes, uh, right. Very interesting. Uh, so about pairing, uh, if you can't find pairs, I had this situation, uh, uh, right, uh, uh, once, because uh, I at first I had seven uh, students, and then one of them uh, gave up. But in that sense, well, they can they can work in in threes, so so this is not a problem. But if they don't have controversial viewpoints, it's it's better if they have because then this transformation process uh, can uh, better take place. Uh, but if they have uh, only uh, very similar viewpoints, well, they they have to agree. They have to reach some consensus. At a certain point, anyway. Okay. Any more questions to the audience? You can unmute yourself or just uh, type it. Well, in the meantime, can I ask you a question? Please do. As far as I see, your phone. Huh? Sorry, someone. Okay. I can't hear you. Yes. Who wants to ask a question? Okay. Mm -hmm. I think I heard someone, but. One new message. <laughs> uh, please tell about the validity of your research. Please tell, let me see. Validity. Okay. Uh, validity of so it's really difficult to um, to use some validity as if as as it is uh, well uh, in um, uh, quantitative studies, mm -hmm. but this is uh, well uh, I, I can say catalytic uh, validity. So that that um, you can agree with this. So the reader can say, okay, I remember this. It makes sense. I can use it. Uh, I, I, I believe in this. So this is the catalytic validity. So here there are no numbers by, by uh, well, uh, um, by no means, 
but really whether there are some uh, resonances uh, in another person. So this is this kind of validity. So Dorota, you like qualitative research. And maybe that's why when you have met this uh, do ethnography, I, mean, I read the book, it changed my life. We were very happy to find another way to look into qualitative research. In what ways do you think it is advantageous or better than qualitative one, quantitative one? Uh -huh. uh, you cannot say that it is better or worse, but not all topics can be addressed quantitatively or qualitatively. Mm -hmm. so everything depends on what you, uh, what you explore, what you investigate. But uh, to my mind, uh, and uh, if I think about my experience with um, teachers, both in service and pre-service, I think that it makes more sense to them when they read uh, qualitative studies. Uh, and I think that uh, if we talk about teacher research and if we want to uh, encourage them to uh, to do research on their own, actual research, for example. So I think that we, we should start with uh, qualitative studies. And then it is about qualitative studies are about humans and it is about understanding. And I, I would say that this is part and parcel of well our jobs to, to better understand teachers and teaching in order to teach better. Okay, thank you. Somebody asked about the, the book that you have mentioned at the beginning. Uh, right. Uh, uh, Show and... Oh, so, so, so you mean uh, the new ethnography book or uh -huh. book that appeared? The question is, could you please tell the name of the book that you mentioned in the beginning? Okay, uh, right. I, I don't know if you can see. Can you see? Maybe the no. cover. Okay, uh, Geo Ethnography uh, in English Language Teaching by Robert Lowe and Luke Lawrence. Okay. Want me to write down? In E, sorry, LT. Uh, okay, Low and mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Well, any comments or questions? Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. So it's a real, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, and um, how can I say? Uh, thanks to everyone who are here uh, at this hour. Um, would you like to say some uh, last words before we close? Uh -huh. Well, thank you very much, uh, everybody. It was so nice, and I really appreciate the fact that you have come. Uh, because I know that it's been a long day for you and it's, well, Friday, right? Uh, the beginning of a weekend, but well, all the best, all the best. Thank you, Dorota. Thank you, Turkey. Thank you. It's a pleasure Turkey. to see you again. <laughs> Good evening. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, stop.